Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second part of the lecture about rheumatoid arthritis. In this lecture, um, I am starting it with the slide which we have discussed in the previous lecture about the three syndromes. Basically, I found this photograph and I include here Sjogren syndrome, Kaplan syndrome, Feltis syndrome. If you will see, this one is the common one. So, xerostomia or dry eyes and dry mouth. Why? Because there is lymphocytic infiltration in the lacrimal gland as well as the salivary glands, right? And Kaplan syndrome and Feltis syndrome, they are rare. Anyhow, um, today our discussion will start, will revolve around the lab diagnosis and then the treatment, right? So, I already show you this criteria, sorry, this criteria, right? And I already told you how clinically, plus with labs, we can diagnose someone with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, now, guys, the important thing over here is what? Sorry. <clears throat> okay, so the important thing over here to talk about is how we know the diagnostic criteria, criteria, right? And seeing that when we do check the ESR and CRP, we do check the rheumatoid factor antibodies as well as anti-CCP and we do uh, check the time, we do, do check the joint. So what are the investigations and in the rheumatoid arthritis? So first of all, we do investigations to establish the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis which you know we will do rheumatoid factor, we will do anti-CCP, we will do ESR, we will do CRP, right? And of course we can do X-rays also. We can use clinical criteria also. Then there are tests to monitor the disease progression. When I say like to monitor the disease progression, of course, how the disease is progressing or either um, you can say the patient is responding to that or not. Then there are investigations to monitor the damage or the disease damage. How much damage does the disease have done? And then there are tests to monitor the drug safety. Of course, like whenever we put someone on the drugs for a long period of time, we must know the side effect of those drugs and we keep on keep on looking for the development of the, those side effects in, in the patients, right? So, if, if I will talk about all the investi investigations, guys, of course, there is a lot of investigations. For example, we can do the CBC, uh, total leukocyte count and like differential leukocyte counts and hemoglobin, ESR, okay, so or CRP, right, or CRP we can check, rheumatoid factors we can check, anti-CCP antibodies we can check. Um, now you can see over here, rheumatoid factor, uh, I explained you this thing already by the way, but okay, for revision of many, rheumatoid factors are basically antibodies that are formed against FC portion of IgGs, okay, and they can be IgM, IgG, or IgA. 85% of the patients with rheumatoid arthritis over the first two years become rheumatoid factor positive. Okay. Some books say 70%. But again, it depends on like where, which area they have done this thing. Now guys, Remember this thing, rheumatoid factor is 80% sensitive, but it is not specific. And its levels don't 
correlate with the disease activity. If the level of rheumatoid factor are high, it doesn't mean like the person have a bad disease. But whenever rheumatoid factor is present, it do shows a severe kind of disease. And as you can see why it is not specific, because all these conditions may give a positive test for rheumatoid factor. I hope you understand this point, right? Then comes, we need some specific antibody. So that is anti-CCP. It has specificity of 95 to, you can say 98%. And it have both diagnostic and prognostic values. Okay. It have both diagnostic and prognostic values and it is highly specific for rheumatoid arthritis now we can check the acute phase reactants and there are many acute phase reactants you can see there is crp or you know acute phase reactants are divided into positive and negative these are the things which are increased whenever there is any inflammation. These are the fact things which are get decreased whenever there is any inflammation. So CRP is a positive acute phase reaction. So it values increases whenever there is any inflammation. So we um, do check uh, CRP time by time because you know um, the whenever like there is increased disease, disease activity, it causes decreased hemoglobin levels simply due to anemia of chronic disease and increased platelets, increase CRP, increase ESR and increase rheumatoid factor. But rheumatoid factor cannot be taken with or correlated with disease activity. Remember this thing guys. So other lab abnormalities can be, I already told you. Anti-neutrophilic antibodies can be present in 30 to 40 percent of the patients. We can do the synovial fluid levels as well, simply because they will just show the inflammatory changes. Other than that, you know, what you will do is we are going to do radio radiographic testing. Now, what radiographs can we do? See, we can do x-rays. Okay. We can do MRIs. We can do ultrasound. Many things are done, right? What are the radiographic features? See, periarticular osteopenia, uniform symmetric joint space narrowing, marginal subchondral erosions, joint subluxation, joint destruction, collapse, ultrasound detects early soft tissue lesions, and MRI has greatest sensitivity to detect sinovite sinovitis and marrow change. So I, I already show you guys. See, this one is like, you can see. The changes over here here very 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 clearly so now you know the diagnostic criteria right we know the diagnostic criteria we had done this one okay so once the diagnosis is done you know what are the other things I, I I must mention over here once the diagnosis is done and you know the patient have diagnosed a diagnosed patient then of course, like, you know, we put the patient on medications and time by time, we keep on calling the patient to do physical examination, to done investigations to check for the disease activity, as well as whatever drugs we are giving, we do investigations to check like how the drugs are working, either they are working fine or not, right? So like, you know, ESR and CRP, they are usually raised when the patient have more, you can say, inflammation on going on. Okay. Same thing is there. So, of course, like once uh, you have done the diagnosis. And one of the things, guys, I wanted to talk about here is there is something called as
it. I must include something here. There is something called as classification of uh, global functional status in rheumatoid arthritis. So we uh, we classify the patients in four classes: class one, um, class two class 3 and class 4 so uh, again like you know I already gave you the concept of ADLs as well as IADLs you know ADLs are activities of daily life which we do daily like uh, grooming feeding um, hygiene locomotion or you you go the, your mobilization you go to the toilets okay and toileting even these are all the activities of daily life which we do perform every day right so what we do like when we ask the patient and as you know it's a chronic type of condition and what happens with time the functional status of the patient it become it decreases for example i will i will show you what do you think someone who have such hands do you expect her to do all the activities normally? So when we examine their hands, you know, uh, we ask them to um, hold the key in her hand, open the jar, close the jar, things like this, right? Just to see what is the functional status of the patient. So class one are basically those people who are able to perform their ideals activities of daily life so they can feed themselves they can groom themselves they can clean themselves they can go to the toilets themselves so they can take care of themselves simply class two are basically those people uh, who are able to perform self-care um, and vocational activities only okay. so these are those who are only able to perform uh, self-care and vocational activities but they cannot perform a vocational activities right so this thing is very 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 important right they cannot perform a vocational activities class 3 are those who are only able to self care but they cannot perform any vocationals activities or a vocational activities right so class one they can perform their ADLs which means like they can self-care they can perform vocational activities as well as a vocational activities okay so they can perform all of them right so this is like class one so see in class two what happens is uh, they can perform the self-care, they can perform the vocational activities, but they cannot perform the avocational activities. Whereas the class three, they are only able to self-care, self but they cannot perform vocational as well as avocational. Okay. So <clears throat> they cannot perform this thing. So no vocational or a vocational, right? And class four is simply guys like all the other people like who cannot, um, what you can say, perform even self care or you can say they have limited um, uh, 
ability for self care to self care okay for self care okay so they have like this thing so guys like what is vocational uh, vocational activity is simply someone who is trained to do something and a vocational is something someone who is not trained to do something right so simply someone uh, for example um, if you open your door every day so that like you can do that but for example if you will go outside and you have to perform some other duty like driving like maybe you cannot perform right so that is the difference between vocational as well as a vocational um, activities right so uh, that that's how we simply uh, check the patient okay patients like we classify the patients like anyone who cannot even self care you know that is considered as class 4 so simply once the diagnosis is done you know then we go for the um, treatment or the management right so uh, when it comes to the management guys uh, of course like uh, what are the goals of management it's, it's a chronic condition there must be some goals so the goals are basically to relieve pain prevent damage or disability perform provide patient education about the disease uh, physical therapy for stretching and range of motion occupational therapy for sprints and adaptive devices and treatment should be started early and should be individualized and early aggressive treatment should be done i would like rather add one more point over here that is um, one of the goal of the therapy is like to uh, you can say remission like to induce remission stop the you can say that exaggerated condition and uh, so or you can say to to induce remission right to induce remission of course like this is one of the most important thing so uh, you know like early diagnosis is very 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 important and you can say the one of the best thing you know uh, drugs which are basically you can say discovered are called as dmards disease modifying anti uh, rheumatic drugs you know they are very 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 important drugs you know they 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 help the patients a lot so you know like they say like in rheumatoid arthritis there is window of opportunity that is like early treatment within the first 3 months of disease which to to induce remission and to control the disease so of course like first of all we weigh the patient every patient individualized treatment means what like we see either the patient is rheumatoid factor positive or negative or see the prognostic prognostic factors you know in the patients uh, simply to to uh, to talk about to think about what kind of condition is there so as i told you know my way is like to first of all talk about um you can say the lifestyle modification okay or conservative management what kind of lifestyle modifications you can do in these patients of course like that is going to play a big 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 role so there is something called as disease activity score as well das score d a s score so they we can we can see we can calculate uh, uh, you can say the disease activity by measuring the das score d a s 28 okay like this is called as i will show you over here again i think like in all of my lectures you know this is now a important part so das 28 online you can found the calculators guys easily so it's a online calculator like this way you can see okay so we measure the das score okay like how many joints has fallen and things like this what is the esr what is the crp uh, 
basically lifestyle modification is simply uh, done um, by of course like first of all you will educate the patient right you will tell the patient you know how the disease looks like and what like how the disease progress you know you you you, you create you tell them all these things of course in this one of course you know in lifestyle modifications in this one it is not going to produce any much effect on the condition because you cannot do this thing but snap techniques smoking address their smoking address their alcohol habits ask them for physical activity or with like especially physical activity with full range of motion exercises right so basically you know uh, that's why physiotherapists they play an important role because they tell them um, exercise programs or they tell them what kind of exercises they can do in the flare up conditions okay what kind of uh, strengthening exercises they can do between the flare ups what kind of aerobic exercises they can do uh, one of the thing you know uh, sometimes if they are doing jobs like this thing you know if someone is, for example, a computer, like an assistant who is working on the computers all the day. So, of course, whenever they have joint problems, you know, their joints get swollen. They cannot work on the computer. So, for them, you know, uh, we can, uh, like in developed world, what they do is like, you know, the doctors, they'll write a letter to the central link or like there are some bodies like this, uh, which provide them with finances you know during the flare-ups because they cannot work anymore with pain pain in the joint or for example what they do they can uh, offer them a other job placement you know um, for like to so you can say like the job modification can be done modification can be done in these patients right and then come of course the pharmacological conditions okay uh, so, remember guys, DMARTs, you know, uh, we can give NSAIDs, but remember the DMARTs, uh, they are the one which alter, uh, as well as, you know, these biological therapies, all this one, these are the one which basically alter uh, the, you can say, the course of rheumatoid arthritis, okay. So they basically change the course of this condition. NSAIDs don't, don't change like these starts to change. So during the flare-ups, when they have the joint swelling, you know, the target is to give provide them physical rest with targeted anti-inflammatory therapy with passive exercises. And what we have to do, we have to suppress the inflammation, guys, okay? And now, rheumatoid arthritis is dealt by a multidisciplinary team in which there is a physiotherapist, there are nurses, there are occupational therapists, there is a doctor. Uh, all these people, they play together to, uh, to deal this condition. So whenever the disease is active, in its active period, we provide them with a bed rest, you know. Sometimes, you know, joint injections can be done. Sometimes we provide, like they provide them with splinting or physiotherapy, things like this. So we can give, okay, for example, NSAIDs can, can be given, you know, there are many types of NSAIDs. So they reduce the pain and swelling. They do not alter the course of the disease. I was telling you this thing. Chronic use should be minimized. Of course, they do have side effects, especially GI bleedings and uh, nephrotoxic. They are all nephrotoxic. Corticosteroids in RA. Corticosteroids can be both systemic as well as intra-articular injections and you know they are mostly used when you can say when a single joint is involved for example uh, or especially intra-articular corticosteroids are used when the different drugs are contraindicated but guys remember Corticosteroids or steroids have a lot of side effects. And this is something bare minimum every medical student should know. 
corticosteroids for long use should not as not um, should not be done in all the in like in, in in the patients why it causes a lot of side effects like weight gain osteoporosis cataracts diabetes easy bruising hypertension hyperlipidemia mood swings you know many 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 side effects are there so all of the medical students they must know the side effects of corticosteroids now the the thing is disease modifying anti uh, rheumatic drugs they are playing the central role in and they are the first choice guys and there are many drugs you know uh, like DMARDs are too much nowadays okay and what we do is like uh, we start with one DMARD and if it is working nice then it's fine otherwise we add something or we change the drug okay so they alter the course of the disease should be used as soon as the diagnosis is made appearance of benefit delayed for two weeks two months and and it must be continued with them until true remission is achieved. So these are the DMARs, methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, lifilinamide, gold, cyclosporin, chloroquine, depenslamine, minocycline, and azotherapine. So there are like many. These are the commonly one. Methotrexate is the most commonly one used, right? So and there is like they have the clear benefit the studies shows they have the clear benefit clear cut benefit they have so you can see like here um, here they are talking about a lot of uh, uh, drugs guys you know the most important one is methotrexate methotrexate is the gold standard and it's the first line remember this thing okay methotrexate is a gold standard and when the method is not working alone, then we can add some drugs like hydroxychloroquine. We add, we can add sulfasalazine. We can add leflunomide. Like we can add certain drugs, but methotrexate is the gold standard. I can I can write over here, gold standard, okay, treatment for these patients. So uh, now you can see that the side effects, right? What kind of monitoring is needed? blood counts, LFTs, chest x-rays, and all this stuff, right? And about other drugs as well. So they are talking about the common one with side effects. and When to start DMARDs, of course, in all the patients. And the period of three months arbitrary has been chosen since a small percent of patients may go in spontaneous remission. So, like, how to select DMARDs? Of course, select methotrexate, first of all, then add on, add then add on, okay? So should it use singly or in combination? By the way, you know, this slide I'm answering from my side, like from my information. But uh, yes, you know, should in the start, it should be used, used sing, sing, singly, but if needed, like add-ons should be made later on, right? So of course, like th these are guidelines given by different uh, agencies, okay? Uh, so this thing. Uh, now, uh, other than um, DMARDs, you can say there are um, other drugs called as biologic drugs. So whenever like there is inadequate response to DMARDs, so we can combine biologics, you know. In that one, you know, um, NTTNF agents are the first line therapy. So NTTNF or NTTMR necrosis factor. Uh, are the first line uh, therapy this one you know in the steps books you will find these books you know infliximab or etanercept or idalimumab there are many others you know see now, nowadays you know, like there is many others like anakin and kinra toclizumab and rituximab and abatacept all these drugs you know and of course, like we, they, they are expensive guys, by the, by the way, they are very, very expensive treatments. Okay. So simply when the DMR, they are not functioning, uh, you can say good. So or acting good. So then we can put an add on with our biologics. Okay. So these are the first line, first line drugs. 
okay and other than this okay again like you know like uh, uh, what is the dose you know like infliximab so 3 mg per kg IV infusion 0 to and 6 weeks you know so we can we have to give like injection form not every day but like weekly or sometime monthly okay uh, we can use so this one is given fortnightly and what are the side effects and what are the contraindications so of course like I'm not interested in like reading all this for you but I'm showing you so of course like we use NSAIDs to reduce the inflammation and pain but we the DMARs are the center of the care and we can use corticosteroids as local injection when some specific joint we have to deal with or we can give it systemically like prednisolone in a low dose okay when like to improve the symptoms in these patients okay but uh, always be careful when you're playing with uh, corticosteroids that's an important thing so 2012 ACR update you know like disease activity is low so DMART monotherapy high so see features of poor prognosis yes anti-DNF with DMART without DMART monotherapy with hydroxychloroquine so disease activity is moderate uh, with poor prognostic factor so combination DMART or without poor prognostic factor like DMART monotherapy so this is like how we go through how we move around and again like the same thing you know when to reassess when to add some drug and all this stuff so again this is one more flow chart which is they're talking about how we monitor the patients guys I told you we will do the ESR CRP we can do a health assessment questionnaire I told you DAS 28 score can be used okay on every uh, visit what they do like they keep on examining the patient not just the joints but the eyes the lungs the spleen all these things okay because we have to check like how the disease is behaving okay how long we have to treat the patient simply once the remission is achieved we have to maintain some dose like relapse occurred in three to five months so uh, one to two months in case of method exit. So if the drug is discontinued in most instances. Okay. So DMARs are discontinued by patients because of toxicity or secondary failure, common after one to two years. And such patients might have a shift over different DMARs over five to ten years. But this thing is like too much complicated, guys, for you. Like I don't know how much you are interested in knowing this thing. Surgical approaches, you know, we can do one thing when the joints are too much damaged, we can do sinovectomy. Okay, so uh, other things, you know, sometimes they go for total joint arthroplasties. Sometimes they go for joint replacements. Sometimes they go for joint fusions. They fuse the joint. Sometimes they go for tendon repair. Sometimes they go for the surgery when there is nerve entrapment, like for example in carpal tunnel syndrome. All these things can be done. So, uh, the last thing, guys, which I wanted to tell you is um, the prognosis. So, I, I think like the prognosis now, it's not written over here. Um, the prognosis, guys, is simply follow up every three to six months, okay, and then like six to 12 months. We always examine the joints. We refer them to the physiotherapist, to the occupational therapist. Um, depending on like how much, how they are doing, we keep on evaluating them. We keep on looking for them for development of any renal disease, any pulmonary disease, any skin disease, any cardiovascular disease. Okay. Uh, we keep on looking them for these things. And... Uh, once we found that, of course, they have rebelled. And later on, of course, when they have disability, then, of course, like, uh, many of these patients are put on assistive devices, of course, like, which help them, okay, to, in surviving, in maintaining, or in adjusting in the community, all these things are done. 
so that's all for the for this rheumatoid arthritis and i will see you in the next lecture thank you